Okay, so it is uh, five minutes in, and so I'm uh, going to get started. Uh, nice to meet everybody. My name is Shara Fitzgerald, and I'm a geriatrician. Uh, if I don't get a message that says uh, no one can hear me or my slide doesn't show up, I'll assume everything is good. Um, I'm a geriatrician. I joined SHN last October, so coming up onto six months soon. And I'm looking forward to presenting today's Grand Rounds on a topic that has been a personal interest of mine for some time. As some of you know, I did my internal medicine training in Toronto and I seniored at St. Michael's Hospital, which is known for its diverse inner city population. Um, and there I was exposed to a patient population that is becoming increasingly relevant in both geriatrics and internal medicine at large. So today I'm going to present an overview of HIV in older adults and some key practice considerations for this group. When you think about HIV, older adults are probably not front of mind. But in the past decade, there's been a small and growing media presence in Toronto about this aging cohort. This quote is from Dr. Philip Berger, who has been a huge advocate for HIV patients at SMH. He says, a number of my patients are astonished they're still alive. Many of them have had their entire social group wiped out. Some are the sole survivors. It's a common experience to be lonely and sad. Here he really highlights the strong emotions that come with aging for many of these patients, whose expectations for their own life expectancy have changed quickly over time. Internists in all specialties will see these patients, particularly in Scarborough, where we are privileged to serve a highly diverse population in all respects. This presents us with a unique opportunity to advocate for people living with HIV and to take a role in their transition into older age. I hope this talk gets you thinking about what that might mean for your practice. I've set out three broad objectives for this talk. First, to recognize the scope and changing patterns for people living with HIV. Second, to identify what considerations need to be made in the diagnosis and treatment in older adults. And third, to understand how comorbidities in older adults might be affected by an HIV diagnosis. So as we all know, antiretroviral therapy was developed in the late 1980s, which means that some patients have now been on therapy for more than 20 years. We're at a point where a treatment adherent person living with HIV who has a good response, meaning a sustained suppression of their viral load and a CD4 count higher than 350, has a life expectancy approaching that of the general population. In this sense, HIV is now a chronic complex illness and people are expected to age with it. That being said, it is taking some time for evidence to catch up with this. In the earliest studies, the definition of older adults was actually 35 years old. In most studies, it's defined as 50 years or older. And in newer studies, we're now seeing cohorts with a median age higher than 65. For example, in Canada, we have one cohort of patients exclusively 65 and older called the Change HIV cohort, which was published, which published preliminary data in December 2022, so very recently. Due to efforts in both treatment and prevention, about half of HIV patients worldwide are over 50 years old. In Canada, it's about one in three. This is not just because of patients aging into the cohort, but in fact, about 17% of new diagnoses are made after the age of 50. And of these new diagnoses in older Canadians, 80% are in cisgender men. We expect these numbers overall to grow. By 2035, three quarters of people living with HIV are forecasted to be over 50. There's a few reasons that aging in context of HIV is important. So let's talk about the interplay between the two. This is a fairly controversial area in research. It has long been believed and clinically identified that there are differences between patients with and without HIV as they age. A synergistic relationship between HIV and aging has been proposed with three theoretical mechanisms. First, there are parallels between the effects of both on the immune system resulting in augmented and earlier immunosenescence. Another aspect is the treatment itself, especially since older adults were typically diagnosed longer ago and were treated with some of the earliest and potentially most toxic HIV drugs, resulting in multi-system damage. And third, there is robust correlation data showing that people living with HIV present earlier and more often with comorbidities that are more prevalent with age, such as hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. More recent guidelines now have specific recommendations for therapy selection based on comorbidity profile. And there's also evidence that HIV patients more often exhibit the frailty phenotype, which we will briefly discuss, than HIV negative patients. 
Here we see a brief overview of the effects of aging and HIV on the immune system. On the left, the effects of age, the contraction of thymic volume, fewer naive T cells, more highly differentiated T cells, and decreased function of both T and B cells. On the right, you can see that HIV then stresses that aging system with a chronic state of immune activation. We know that there are elevated cellular and soluble markers of immune activation in chronic HIV infection, worst in the early stages and improving with ART, but never actually resolving to normal levels. It is thought that microbial translocation from the GI tract may be contributing to this. This heightened state of activation results in a higher turnover, increasing the speed of aging of T cells and also accelerating B cell dysfunction. So overall, this whole process leads to an immune system in decline and or immunosenescence. Some experts describe this as having an immune system that is physiologically older than their birth date. In other words, a physiologic age that is older than chronologic age. Older adults are sicker at the time of diagnosis. A study of 8,255 older adults in the UK found that almost half of older adults had a CD4 count of less than 200 when diagnosed, compared to less than a third of younger adults. The repercussions of that late diagnosis are also worse in older adults who have 14 times the mortality rate when their CD4 count at the time of diagnosis was under 200 versus higher than 200. As you compare all patients with late diagnosis, the older patients have 2.4 times the mortality of a younger patient. And remember, we're just talking about patients in their 50s and 60s here, not in their 80s and 90s. One of the reasons for this late diagnosis is delay. The CDC reports that the median delay over age 50 for diagnosis is 4.5 years, which is the longest in any age group. So overall, older age at diagnosis matters because it means the patient probably had a longer delay to diagnosis time, and they're more likely to have a worse CD4 count to diagnosis, which leads to an increased risk of death. So let's look at some of the reasons for this delay. We should first recognize that when a patient is newly diagnosed with HIV after age 50, some obviously contracted it before age 50, but about 48% also contracted it as an older adult. In these patients, the number one risk factor is by far sexual exposure. Sharing needles accounts for about 20% and blood transfusion risks are essentially negligible. In cisgender men, the most common transmission in resource rich countries occurs between men who have sex with men. In resource poor countries, it is heterosexual transmission. For cisgender women, the highest risk is through heterosexual intercourse. Risk of transmission increases with age due to vulvovaginal atrophy and decreased mucosal lubrication. Regrettably, I do not have sufficient research to provide risk factors for older transgender men and women, but I certainly will update this talk as soon as I do. One of the reasons that we underdiagnose this population is because we as healthcare providers underestimate sexual activity in our older patients. Now, we are limited to survey data on this topic, but several such studies have indicated that it is rising. In one, 53% of 65 to 75 year olds and a quarter of 75 to 85 year olds reported that they were sexually active regularly, which was defined as at least two times a month. But worryingly, 91% of these encounters was reported to be without barrier protection. There are many other considerations that present challenges for uh, prevention in this age group. For example, there are a lot of changing relationships in later life, resulting in potentially new sexual partners. There's also a reluctance to discuss sex with doctors and a historically limited sexual education in this population. So assuming that we effectively identify an older patient at risk and then diagnose them, what are some considerations for treatment? To determine this, we look at both immune recovery or essentially the rise in CD4 count and the virologic suppression. So here I have the four most significant cohorts that formed the basis for our understanding with the total number of patients in each cohort for your reference. In the COHERE cohort, the patients over 60 were 7% less likely to have their CD4 count increased by 100 or more in two years. In the NA Accord cohort, they again found there was less immunologic response of the age um, as the age of the time of treatment initiation increased. And then in the ART cohort collaboration and the French hospital database, there was a greater risk of clinical progression to AIDS defining illness or death while on treatment if you were over the age of 50. This is a nice figure from the French hospital database as an example. The solid lines are patients under 50 and dotted are patients over 50. 
The top graph shows everyone, the middle shows only patients with baseline CD4 count over 200, and the bottom shows baseline CD4 count under 200. The vertical axis is mean increase in CD4 count, and the horizontal axis is time in months. In each graph, they separate each panel by baseline viral load, essentially either high or low, as shown on the right-hand side. So that's why there are two pairs of lines in each graph. As you can see, the dotted line representing the group over 50 has a lower mean CD4 increase in all cases, except the very bottom, which represents patients with low CD4 counts and low viral load. In terms of clinical progression, as mentioned, you do see higher rates in the older cohorts compared to younger. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve from the same study, looking at progression to either AIDS-defining event or death over time. During the first year of treatment, 5% of younger patients had a new AIDS-defining event or died, compared to 10.2% of older patients. Again, we're just talking about patients 50s and 60s in the older cohorts. Five years after ART initiation, it was 12.4% of younger versus 21.9% of older patients. The adjusted hazard ratio of clinical progression was 1.52 for the older group than in the younger group, and 1.5 if you only look at AIDS-defining events. However, these cohort studies also found that in contrast to less robust CD4 responses, older people actually achieve equivalent or superior virologic responses to, anti to antiretroviral therapy when compared to younger persons. So in the French hospital database cohort at six months, 70.6% of younger than 50 reached a viral load less than 500 copies per mil versus 76.6 over 50 years old. When they looked at the full five-year timeline, the effect persisted. And this result has also been supported by the HIV care continuum CDC surveillance data. So overall, older adults start with lower CD4 counts, have worse CD4 recovery counts on therapy, have relatively good viral suppression, and still have worse clinical outcomes than younger patients. Now, we understand how older adults respond to treatment, so let's look at some principles for approaching their care. So as we all know, most people living with HIV should start treatment regardless of CD4 count and virologic load, and the earlier they start, the better. So this is particularly true for older adults. The START trial was an RCT in asymptomatic people living with HIV that randomized patients to either start treatment when they had CD4 counts below 350, called the deferred group, or start when CD4 counts were higher than 500, called the immediate group. The primary endpoint was serious AIDS-defining illness or death from AIDS. They also looked at serious non-AIDS illness and non-AIDS-related death. In a post hoc analysis, they estimated event rates and risk reduction between the deferred and immediate treatment groups and looked at which subgroups benefited most. They found significant heterogeneity and absolute risk reduction across age subgroups with a maximum benefit for, partic for participants aged 50 years and older. So in this initial forest plot, you see the whole group with a result favoring immediate treatment as you move right. And you can see that for all three primary endpoints, there is benefit to immediate art. And then this forest plot separates out the subgroups, and you can see clearly that the absolute risk reduction, which is the x-axis, is much higher than the is much higher with immediate treatment in the oldest subgroup at the bottom, with a very significant p-value of 0 0.0022 for heterogeneity. Older adults may actually be more adherent to their medication therapy than younger adults. This has been previously identified in some case control studies and is reflected in some more recent CDC surveillance data, which you can see here. When asked if they'd taken their doses every day in the past 30 days, the 55 and older group responded yes 67% of the time, which was higher than any other group. Interestingly, in some of the previous data, it was also found that older adults are more adherent to their HIV therapy than their other medications, suggesting a greater concern about HIV than other comorbidities. And similarly, in terms of engagement in their medical care, patients 55 and older were least likely to have missed an appointment in the past 12 months compared to other groups from the same CDC data. Of course, there are many other factors that could explain this, such as retirement, more availability of time, but it does point towards the majority of older adults adhering to treatment. Now, of course, antiretroviral therapy is not innocuous, and there are several important age-related considerations. First, most drugs weren't studied in aging populations. Second, the older a patient gets, the more interpatient variability there is with treatment. 
Part of this is because of the changes in the way adults metabolize drugs as they're older. Adiposity goes up, stomach pH goes up, meaning that absorption can be affected and age affects enzyme systems that are needed to process the drugs. For example, P450 enzyme system can be less effective in older adults, resulting in higher doses of protease inhibitors and NNRTIs. This change happens to different extents in different patients, making it hard to predict how one individual will respond, particularly when we consider the different constellations of comorbidities in these patients. We also know that age affects liver and renal function, which can increase the toxicity of the drugs and in some cases require dose adjustments. And then there's polypharmacy. So polypharmacy is a real issue in these patients. The median number of medications that they take is 13. Half are on a cardiovascular med, 10% on a GI med, like a PPI, and 6% are on hormonal treatment. Not surprisingly, older HIV positive patients are more likely to have a drug-drug interaction than younger patients by about 20%. The likelihood of interactions is also higher when you compare older HIV positive patients to older HIV negative patients. Um, in one cohort in San Francisco, they looked at patients over 60 and 70% of HIV patients had at least one category D drug-drug interaction compared with 39% of age and sex matched controls without HIV. That study also examined potentially inappropriate medications using the American Geriatric Society FEARS criteria and found that over half of patients were prescribed at least one potentially inappropriate medication compared to 29% of adults without HIV. So I really like the hivdruginteractions.org website from the University of Liverpool. It has very detailed information about each individual drug and its interactions. These are just some examples of the possible interactions that I pulled from the site and the general effect on protease inhibitors and NNRTIs. So if you look through, you'll notice that, some, that quite often the protease inhibitor and then the NNRTI have an opposite effect. So the overall levels would be very unpredictable. This is a bit less applicable now that integrase strand transfer inhibitors are the first line therapy because they have less interactions, but there are also considerations for those. For example, you have to time administration of polyvalent cations such as calcium and iron supplements because they affect absorption. And integrase strand transfer inhibitors also have a significant interaction with many anticonvulsants, some antibiotics and some antifungals. The risk of drug interactions has been acknowledged in several guidelines, uh, most notably the European AIDS Clinical Society, whose website offers this decision-making support tool to help clinicians think through the appropriateness of every drug being taken by a patient with HIV in order to minimize potential interactions. And then the BC Center of Excellence in HIV AIDS and the International Anti uh, Antiviral Society also provide some parallel recommendations for older adults when choosing therapy. For integrase strand transfer inhibitors, they caution about weight gain. For efavirenz, there can be neuropsychiatric side effects. And for uh, dolutegravir, there can be insomnia and sleep disturbances, which worsen with age. So for the last section of the talk, I'd like to focus on comorbidities and geriatric syndrome. We will look at whether comorbidities are common, whether HIV affects them, and if treatment is affected by an HIV diagnosis. So as the HIV population ages, the pattern of comorbidity and mortality has changed. AIDS-related illness and opportunistic infections have declined, while there is an overall increase in non-AIDS morbidity. There is also emerging evidence that patients with HIV are at an increased risk for many classic age-associated comorbidities and that they can present earlier. When thinking about multimorbidity, there are two main theories in how HIV and age interplay. With accelerated aging, an age-related condition occurs at an earlier age in patients with HIV. The pattern of distribution is the same, it's just shifted down the axis of time. With accentuated aging, the age-related condition occurs at the same time as it would in the general population, but more frequently or more severely. Comorbidities are common. More than half of patients aged 50 to 59 have one, obviously, and that number goes up to 66% after age 60, also no surprise to us. About 40% of deaths in older HIV patients are because of these comorbidities and not because of AIDS-related illnesses or infection, and that number is growing as people are aging into this cohort. And if you're wondering how this compares to the general population, based on prevalences alone, one case control study concluded that the comorbidity burden in HIV patients is comparable to a general population that is a decade older. 
The most common comorbidities are hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and endocrine disease, such as diabetes and thyroid. Other common comorbidities include DVTs, hepatitis C virus co-infection, renal impairment, and liver disease. Factors associated with multimorbidity were, of course, CD4 count under 200, older age, male sex, and prolonged art exposure. So cardiovascular disease is one of the best studied comorbidities. Large cohort studies have consistently shown a relative risk of 1.5 to 2 in HIV patients. For example, this table is from the Veterans Aging Cohort Study, VAX, and specifically looks at MIs. You can see in the red box that the incidence rate ratio is greater than one for all age groups, except the 80 to 89 group. And I will say that the number of participants and events were quite low overall in that group. You can see the rate ratio is between 1.3 and about 2.2 with the 30 to 39 cohort most affected by HIV status. This may suggest that as patients age, their traditional risk factors start playing more of a role, evening out the ratio, um, which you do see across the 50 to 89 range. The AHA re uh, released a scientific statement in 2019 recognizing the higher CV rates in people living with HIV. Um, the pathophysiology is not completely understood, but felt to be related to an interplay between the chronic inflammation, immune dysregulation, side effects, and other metabolic changes. The AHA also pointed to several modifiable risk factors that um, were found to be higher in people living with HIV, including a higher prevalence of smoking, metabolic syndrome, hepatitis C, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. HIV has a direct impact on the lipid profile. In the most immunodeficient states, there's an increase in triglycerides, mostly seen in research pre-therapy. And more recently, there's evidence to suggest that the level of oxidized LDLC may increase with chronic immune activation, leading to atherogenic dyslipidemia. However, older overall levels of LDLC are not actually elevated in patients with good treatment responses. And then the other contributor is the treatment itself. Protease inhibitors increase LDL levels. Some of the older drugs cause lipodystrophy, and several treatments have been implicated in either altered profiles or generally increased overall CV risk. So next we have bone health. People living with HIV are vulnerable to osteoporosis for several reasons. So first, there are several external risk factors that are more prevalent in this population, including reduced physical activity, low BMI, smoking, alcohol, and steroid use. Secondly, the state of chronic T cell activation in these patients results in cytokine production that has a direct effect on osteoclast activity via increased rank L expression and decreased osteoprotegerin activity. This induces bone loss. And then additionally, HIV increases TNF alpha activation, which promotes apoptosis of osteoblasts. Another component is vitamin D deficiency, but this is more controversial. There are a few initial studies that found a higher prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in people living with HIV, but these studies were criticized for having a disproportionately black study population. So that a newer study called the SUN study, based on the National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey in the U.S., found that 70% of patients with HIV had a vitamin D level under 75, compared to 79% of the general population. So overall, HIV may not be associated with higher levels of vitamin D deficiency, but on the other hand, it's the majority of your patients anyways. And finally, antiretroviral therapy itself can influence bone health. So there was one meta-analysis of 10 studies comparing patients on ART to those not on ART. Those on therapy had a pooled odds ratio of 2.5 for reduced BMD, meaning osteopenia or osteoporosis in that study. And then tenofovir DF in particular has been found to reduce bone mineral density through the exact, though the exact mechanism is not that clear. And we also know from some protease inhibitors, such as darunavir and ritonavir, um, that they interfere with vitamin D metabolism through inhibiting enzymes in the uh, hepatocytes and monocytes. What about fracture risk? Um, there was a meta-analysis on this in 2020. The pooled estimated prevalence of fracture was 6.6% in people living with HIV, which is a pooled odds ratio of 1.9. They also looked at specific risk factors in the HIV population and identified older age had an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.4. Smoking and hepatitis C co-infection were other notable risks. For the effect of treatment, we don't have meta-analysis data, but there have been some cohort studies. The Eurocida cohort showed higher incidence of fracture in patients who had ever used tenofovir DF or were currently on it but there wasn't actually an association between fracture risk um, and cumulative exposure to TDF or any other type of therapy. 
And then the Veterans Health Administration Registry also showed that cumulative therapy was not a risk factor, but that tenofovir specifically was. So overall, the effect on bone health is multifactorial, but HIV and some of its treatments can increase fracture risk. Moving on to malignancies, for HIV, from the HIV and cancer registry data, there are some cancers that seem to develop at a relatively younger age among people living with HIV. This is an example of that accelerated model, which I've put at the top right as the reminder. Lung cancer developed an average of four years earlier and anal cancer developed about three years earlier. For other cancers in that particular registry data, there wasn't a difference in age of onset. The strongest risk factor for developing malignancy was in fact age. And now we're starting to get more updated information on the causes of death in people living with HIV that is suggesting more and more that malignancy is a major contributor to mortality and not necessarily AIDS-related malignancy. So this cohort study is, was from the Lancet Public Health followed patients from 1997 to 2012. 58% was of deaths were attributable to AIDS-defining illnesses. In the other 42% of cases, the causes were quite varied, but the next co most common cause was non-AIDS malignancy at 8%, followed closely by cardiovascular and stroke at 7.8%. And then other infections, liver disease, substance use, um, suicide, and accidents were other common causes. I'd like to touch on neurocognitive disorders briefly because this is particularly relevant to my own practice, and our understanding of this has changed quite a lot over the years. So we know that HIV causes cognitive impairment. The pathophysiology is thought to be multifactorial, involving HIV entering the CNS and then persistent CNS inflammation. The syndrome itself has been known by many names, including AIDS encephalitis and AIDS dementia complex. But then in 2007, the first Scotty criteria was developed, and now we refer to a spectrum of HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders, or HAND. There are three levels asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment, mild neurocognitive disorder, and HIV-associated dementia. To have any of these diagnoses, you have to have at least two cognitive domains affected. For asymptomatic or mild, the impairment must be one standard deviation from the mean or more. For HIV dementia, you must be two standard deviations away from the norm. And then you stratify by functional impairment. So for asymptomatic, there's no effect on function. For mild, there's a mild effect which is loosely defined as help with two IADLs or not able to do a complicated job anymore. I should mention that this deviates from the standard non-HIV related mild cognitive impairment diagnosis for which you cannot really have any significant functional impairment. And then finally for HIV associated dementia, you have to have marked interference with daily function. So such as needing help with a basic uh, ADL. To make this diagnosis, you of course need to rule out other contributors, such as opportunistic infections, stroke, toxic or metabolic encephalopathies, or confounders like head trauma, psychiatric disease, or substances. And as patients age, we must also bear in mind that people living with HIV can also be subject to regular neurodegenerative diseases, uh, most notably Alzheimer's disease. How does HIV-associated dementia present? So the classical teaching is a subcortical picture you see impaired attention and concentration, a slowing of their processing speed, executive dysfunction and apathy. The more cortical abilities like language, longer term memory and praxis are typically intact. And then on imaging, you'll see cerebral atrophy in the basal ganglia, especially the caudate. And then to identify these changes, you really need a MOCA or send them for a neuropsych uh, assessment because the NMSE doesn't really tease out executive dysfunction very well. Not surprisingly, HIV-associated dementia does increase with age. Older patients in the Hawaii aging cohort were twice as likely as their younger counterparts to have HIV-associated dementia after adjusting for other known risk factors. So in the early days, patients often presented with HIV-associated dementia, which typically occurs in patients with CD4 counts under 200 and high viral plasma loads. This has changed in the uh, antiretroviral era. So the charter cohort has provided the most data on this um, in patients on treatment. So when we looked at it, there was cognitive impairment in 52% of their participants. 33% of that was asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment. 12% had mild and only 2% of the overall cohort had HIV associated dementia. They also identified several risk factors for dementia, including age, lower CD4 count, as we said, substance use, sleep disorders, psychiatric comorbidities, hepatitis C co-infection, and CBD. 
When they followed these patients for repeat neuropsych testing over a mean of three years, 61% remained stable, 17% improved, and 23% worsened. And what's encouraging is that the severity of cognitive impairment has improved with the widespread use of antiretroviral therapy. So this graph shows the distribution of dementia before 1996, when ART was not widespread, and then after 1996. So you can see that in the before era, the light green bars, the distribution favored uh, dementia, including more severe impairment. And then after therapy, the dark green bars, the distribution heavily skews towards the less severe end of the spectrum. So frailty, I would not be a geriatrician if I did not discuss frailty as one of the significant comorbidities in this population. So frailty is a state of decreased physiologic reserve with an increased vulnerability to stressors. And it's been described in two main ways, either as a phenotype as shown here, or as an accumulation of deficits, which can be conveyed through frailty indices. So in most HIV uh, research, the frailty phenotype is used. You have to have three of the five characteristics to be considered phenotypically frail. The Dutch age HIV cohort screened everyone for frailty and found that in middle age, which was a mean of 52 years old, there was a higher prevalence of frailty in the people living with HIV than those without at 10% versus 3%. The cohort was then followed with visits every two years. And in a follow-up study, they found that patients with HIV had twice the risk of progressing from non-frail to frail during the study, which lasted six years. The specific risk factors for frailty were examined in a systematic review that was published in the Journal um, of, of American Geriatric Society in 2016. You can see them listed here, increased age, um, cognitive impairment, depression, a less than high school education, an abnormal BMI, and detectable viremia. Um, but what is encouraging is that in more recent studies, we're starting to see signals that patients with a well-controlled HIV, good CD4 counts, and virologic suppression may have similar frailty risk to age-matched cohorts, and those studies are ongoing. We often conceptualize frailty as a helpful prognosticator for mortality, hospitalization, and physiologically stressful treatments such as surgery or chemotherapy. So the Veteran Aging Cohort Study Index, or VAX Index, was developed as a kind of frailty index for patients with HIV. It used age, routinely monitored indicators of HIV disease, and general indicators of organ system injury, like hemoglobin, platelets, AST, ALT, uh, hepatitis C, and creatinine. And it was found to predict all-cause mortality, cause-specific mortality, and several other outcomes better in patients with HIV. Um, and some of the other outcomes that it can predict are fragility fractures, neurocognitive, and functional impairment. And there's now an updated version, VAX 2.0, which is on an MD calc, so you can use it for your own patients. Finally, I just want to bring your attention to the clinical care guidelines developed by the Ontario HIV Treatment Network as part of the Provincial HIV AIDS Strategy to 2026. These guidelines do have a whole section of considerations for older adults, which I've pulled from the website here. You can see that comprehensive and integrated care are priorities, and they do recommend principles of geriatric and rehabilitation disciplines that are incorporated into care. I think this really acknowledges that HIV is now this chronic complex condition and should be approached by such, uh, as such by all providers. And they specifically recommend the completion of a durable power of attorney for healthcare, advanced care directives, and formal medication assessment for polypharmacy, all of which are components of the comprehensive geriatrics uh, assessment and something that we are always happy to help with. And that's it. Thank you so much. Um, and I welcome any questions you might have. Thanks so much, everyone. So I guess if there's uh, no questions, 
then everyone have a great day.